Today on Hashtag Lawyered, we're going to talk about personal injury law, why the ambulance chasing images you may have in your head couldn't be further from the truth. We've got our good friend Paul Wingo here to lay it out and tell you what you need to know about what happens if you get hurt. Welcome back to Hashtag Lawyer, y'all. We've got the A-Team back in the studio. Hey. And, and we're talking about a subject that we haven't really covered much. No, our, we have not. year-long podcast, but it's year something... Long. You and I talk about this all the time. Sure. There's a lot of misconceptions about personal injury. Yes. And, and we've got our good friend Paul Wingo here today mm-hmm. from Hamilton Wingo. He's a, a founding partner of the firm, and, and he, um, he and his firm focus on personal injury cases, everything from auto accidents to medical accidents to dangerous products. And he really is going to lay out a lot for us today and hopefully demystify a lot of these misconceptions that you and I have spoken about quite a 100%. bit. So, Paul, thank you so much for being here today. How do you do? <laughs> it's good to see you. Well, you know, real quick, we always like to give a little background on, mm-hmm. on our guests. So kind of tell the folks where you're from and, and how you got into personal injury law. All right. Well, uh, Paul Wingo here. I am a fifth generation Texan. Grew up out in Weatherford, Texas. Uh, I have uh, enjoyed uh, the bounties of this great country through our public education system, became a a lawyer through uh, all of our public schools and public financing. I have married and had a child with my high school sweetheart. I have a two-year-old boy named Arthur who... uh, very, uh, very excited about things like uh, bugs right now. So <laughs> that's, that's super cool. Um, I, through hard work and honestly kind of stumbling into it, have found myself in a very rewarding field of uh, handling catastrophic personal injury cases. And so that's my life now. And it, 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 it's interesting as far as the legal field goes, um, it's one of the probably truest calling areas because you are dealing with true causes for people. Um, and so it's been a real um, joy to have my professional life match up with something that I actually feel is rewarding. Yeah, and, and Paul, that's what I hear a lot, a lot of personal injury mm-hmm. lawyers say. And, and we say this term personal injury, the three of us know what it means. We have a general idea. But for our listeners, can you kind of lay out what, what are specific types of accidents or types of cases that really fall under this personal injury umbra- umbrella? All right, yeah. So in our world, um, there are a variety of things that can hurt or injure us. And so we have in America developed a system of civil redress of those wrongs. So that's a fancy way of saying, if you get hurt by someone else's negligence, uh, there are, depending on the laws, ways to seek compensation to help with the medical expenses, the uh, lost economics, the pain and suffering, and the different impacts that it has on individuals' lives. And you, you mentioned that word negligence, and, and you know we kind of understand that too. And there's really kind of a sliding scale of negligence, and, and that's kind of a fancy way of saying uh, someone else's mistake, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, like uh, if I like am working in your studio there, and I hang a light precariously above y'all while y'all are filming. Um, And I'm like, "Eh, I'm kind of hungover and I'm tired. (laughs) I don't do a really good job of it. And then lo and behold, during one of your important episodes of Lawyered, the light comes crashing down. You are both grievously injured. Um, That might be a situation where we need to investigate if someone was negligent. Yeah. And and then there's also, you know, that's kind of a, I don't want to say honest mistake because you you were hungover, but, you know, (laughs) some of us have been there a lot. Uh, but, the, you know, there's another sliding scale where you've got, okay, a company that hasn't investigated and invested in their safety procedures, and maybe they've got mm-hmm. some scaffolding that they've got rusty nail or rusty screws in because rusty screws. They, haven't, mm-hmm. they haven't maintained it and followed OSHA proceedings and all that kind of stuff. That still falls under negligence, just a little bit on the, the more intense end, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we have to look at it in different ways, right? So we have a capitalist system in America. Um, our businesses are developed. Um, for the like purpose of profit generation. And that's fine, that's our system and that's what we live in. So our businesses do not have an incentive 
for safety. Um, their, their incentive is to maximize profit. And, and that's what they're supposed to be doing. So a lot of times what happens is that they end up cutting corners or cutting, you know, dramatic, like, like safety protocols out of the loop because they are not like, uh, I guess, cost aware in the marketplace. Well, who bears that burden? You know, should a member of society who is grievously injured as a result of that, uh, that profit centered negligence? Because I don't think people in the most part are ever intentionally meaning to hurt someone. Right. It's just when you set up a system on a house of cards, it predictably will like fall down. And so that's what we see uh, in, a, in, a, in a space, in an area where, you know, we focused a lot on deregulation and, you know, the, uh, you know, privatization of these different like businesses. And uh, so it, it's, it's a way to try to restore some sort of balance in our society. And it becomes an effective mechanism to deter uh, bad behavior when the only thing that really incentivizes it is a market penalty uh, of, of some sort of, uh, you know, you know, increased expense to the company, um, you know, as a result of their negligence. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really interesting. And so, Paul, we discussed in our pre-show conference call about what I like to call the pyramid of PI cases, right? So why don't you explain that pyramid of PI cases to the audience a little bit and the critical lessons to be learned from that pyramid. Yeah, and you know, and this pyramid will help uh, help me kind of give some context. Um, a lot of my uh, compatriots in the personal injury world, we see them on TV shouting, doing crazy stuff. I may have had commercials at one point a long time ago uh, in the dark days of my youth. Uh, but essentially, in this world, there's a pyramid of injuries. And essentially, you look at like what causes the most injuries uh, and kind of like the least severe injuries, and then goes up to uh, what are the most catastrophic, systemic uh, like injuries that have life-changing implications. So we have hundreds of millions of people on our roadways every day. We are driving several thousand pound vehicles uh, at high rates of velocity. So let's say you hit someone going 20 miles an hour in a two or a thousand pound vehicle. Well, that is going to be 20,000 pounds of force that is exerted onto the vehicle that you hit. And so our little squishy bodies are just not physically designed to handle uh, those, uh, those, those delta forces on our body. And so those are kind of at the bottom of the pyramid because there's just a huge amount of people that experience that. And so in order to essentially build up around this marketplace, there have become volume providers of essentially services that handle people that have injuries that might fit within a $30,000 policy world. And so, so that is the broadest universe. And then as it goes up, you've got uh, people that are involved in claims where they are hurt while in a doctor's care. Like a doctor fails to provide them oxygen or some very, uh, easily uh, fixable thing that becomes more and more uh, problematic and they're injured. So you've got like medical malpractice claims and then you have products claims where a device or an, uh, something has been uh, created and put into the flow of commerce that is dangerous to our society. Um, and, and so you kind of go up these lines and then you, know, you get to these cases that are these one-off catastrophic events where someone has lost their life where uh, a, a child has a, a, a brain injury that they're going to be needing, you know, consistent help for the rest of their life. Someone has lost a limb, has lost uh, ability to function as a human, and you need people to help you figure out what in the heck do you do in that situation? 
because I it is it, you know when you when you go from being charming and 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 handsome like y'all to immediate hard stop like what does your family do you know like how do you deal with that and and that's where essentially we step in and the goal is to take at least the legal burden off of the family so they can try to focus on healing and dealing with the issues like at hand and so that's kind of you know, kind of how I view the, the personal injury sphere. And so I've had the good fortune to have a firm that just focuses on those catastrophic injuries. And so it is very different from a large volume operation of small cases to a small operation that handles very catastrophic cases. So all of, all of my clients have my cell phone, like all of them are you know, I have close personal relationships with them um, because I'm trying to help them get through the worst situation of their life. And so would some of these catastrophic cases include, for example, helicopter crashes? Helicopter crashes, um, you know, you know, the, 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 the Kobe Bryant case. I mean, that is a huge situation of what issues went wrong to lead to that tragic loss of life. You know, we, we have uh, airplane uh, accidents because you know, the reality is in, in aviation issues, um, the passengers lose. There's, you know, despite best efforts and safety, almost all scenarios where you come out of, out of the sky, you, you're going to be looking at catastrophic loss. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons why we have a such a safe aviation system is that it is twofold, highly regulated, and people bring massive claims mm -hmm. uh, in order to, you know, balance out when these horrible losses occur. And so that, you know, helps us keep this system, you know, one of the, the safest uh, modes of travel, you know, that humans have ever devised. It sounds like the aviation industry then has a lot of incentive to be safety oriented, unlike some other industries, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I think actually that this actually jumps right in just to kind of segue into, into mm -hmm. our misconceptions. I think it actually tackles Absolutely. that very first one. Is So, you know, Paul, I think what I hear a lot, right, from some of my friends who might not be lawyers, you know, maybe some of my friends who are doctors, <laughs> have told me that they say, Andrea, look, I, yeah, I lawyers, okay. I feel like they're all ambulance chasers and there are these these goofballs who create these ridiculous commercials and they have ridiculous names on billboards and they're just coming after me. They're suing doctors and I, I didn't do anything wrong. You know, I, I feel like I can barely practice medicine because I'm worried about being sued by these ambulance chasers. So, you know, Paul, why don't you kind of walk us through that misconception, if you will? Okay. And, you know, every misconception is born of parts of reality, right? Sure. Mm -hmm. sure. And Absolutely. Any, any organized area where humans are endeavoring to do anything, there are, uh, pardon my French, uh, shitty people. And so <laughs> uh, that's that's the reality of the situation. There, there definitely are people that try to abuse any kind of system. Um, it just so happens that because of the public facing advertising, uh, there is a very large reach of people that people might feel have cynical uh, ambitions dealing with the injury world. So, it, you know, it's a real perception and, and, I, and I understand it. But let's also look at the reality of the situation. There has been an insane marketing effort over the last 20 years. And it, and it was actually interesting. There was a study done. Uh, by one of the, the largest advertising and marketing firms in the world uh, back in the 90s. And essentially, they're like, well, how can, we, how can we make the bottom line? Well, we need to demonize this group of people. One perfect example is the McDonald's case. I think, I think we've all heard about like, oh, that ambulance chasing. You get a, you get a hot cup of coffee and you spill it on yourself and you think, you know, you should get millions of dollars. What kind of BS is that? 
<laughs> you know, it's true. And I, you know what? Yeah. As a basic narrative, that that resounds pretty easily to me, right? Like, sure. and we're all forced to pay insurance premiums for our cars and all these different things, right? So, you know, and in, in, in the health costs are skyrocketing and we're just like, oh, well, let's think about that case. You have a situation there. This woman goes to McDonald's, gets a cup of coffee in the drive-thru, give it to her, the lid's like not on right, spills on her lap. The coffee has been superheated to mm -hmm. such a level that it literally scalds and burns her genitals to like third degree level. Yeah. She has to go and have all of these like reconstructive skin graft surgeries to like fix her ability just to go to the bathroom, right? I mean, this is horrific burns. Well, okay, I mean, that, you know, stuff happens. I, I, you know, I'm not, whatever, but let's, let's, let's like, like look into it a little bit further. Uh, McDonald's at the time had figured out that they could procure uh, worldwide vastly cheaper coffee beans, but still extract the same amount of taste and caffeine if they superheated the beans. I actually so, know that part. They were able, essentially, through this process, to save about $100,000 a day worldwide. The jury, when seeing, oh, and here's another thing a lot of people don't know. Uh, that woman just wanted them to pay her medical bills. That's, That's very it. reasonable. She didn't, she didn't, she wasn't trying to get any, like, big settlement. But the jury was so inflamed that this market practice, this cynical market practice, they awarded large punitive damages to punish them and deter them from that behavior. Because in a market system, profit is the number one incentive and safety is not. And so that's what punitive damages are there for, to punish, because what, you know, they pay this woman a hundred grand or 50 grand for her medical expenses. Does that in any way deter their behavior in the future? No, no, because they're literally saving that amount of money every half a day by this practice. Yeah. So yeah. that's the idea of trying to get, you know, the punitive system. But let me tell you, that was not the narrative that people heard right. for the last 20 years until a documentary came out the last few years on Netflix. Yeah. I mean, and, and it was ubiquitous in our society. Like, oh, ambulance chasing coffee around. <laughs> yeah. Coffee, like, and I mean, I, and I probably fell in that same category before I actually saw it. Yeah. And so that's yeah. part of the deal, right? Like, uh, no one wants to be dislodged of money. Mm -hmm. Right. We have a cynical system that is designed in order to try to keep people from being dislodged of money. And they see our profession as a threat to that. Um, and so it is very easy to target us as the people, especially when you have these, you know, yahoos like, I got a case. It's <laughs> all the money in the universe. Like, that, it, we're an easy group to target. Easy target. So, very easy sure. target. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Well, and Paul, I, I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought up the McDonald's case. My brother mm -hmm. and I talk about that all the time because. He actually had a similar misconception before. Oh, did he really? Yeah. Well, yeah. And then I went to law school and uh -huh. kind of learned some stuff and we talked through it. And learned but, a few things in law school. Right. But, you know, <laughs> learned some stuff about that case. And it's just people don't understand mm -hmm. and see, you know, all the things that yeah. went behind. And I think that's it's a great. heartbreaking. It is. And I think it's a great example of the, the narrative being phrased mm -hmm. one way, but then you learn about what actually happened and, and the good that's come from it mm -hmm. since then. McDonald's has been punished, so they're changing their ways. And, and everything you were talking about before, I mean, I think that really, it helps dissuade a lot of that that information mm -hmm. about okay yes there are ambulance chases out there but there are there's a reason that we have this profession and they are doing great things for they society. are and that leads me into my next question which is paul so you know we've got these ambulance chasers who maybe are do exist right you know perhaps some of the ones that are on the billboards or on the tv commercials maybe they're you know, kind of cool. totally awesome people and, and maybe friends of mine so yeah. you know not not everyone is is awful who does that so i don't want to like <laughs> Sure, and maybe it works for them. But, you know, kind of tell us how Hamilton Wingo has a different approach. Well, so we we are kind of a, a lawyer's law firm. And by that, I mean, is 
we do not derive any clients from direct advertising or anything like that. Um, we get our clients almost exclusively through word of mouth lawyer referrals. And so what that means and, and what it's our pleasure and honor to try to be is the person and the group of people that you would call if one of you had something tragic happen to your family and you wanted to make sure that they got the best advice and legal counsel that they could possibly have. And so that's been our founding kind of business model is that uh, we, are, we are going to try to do everything the best. So that means that we will spend the money that it takes uh, and, and have the resources and, and staffing that are necessary to try to help people through these horrific times in the best manner possible. Now that sounds expensive. How if, say, Jane is in a horrific glider incident, right? She's in a glider, like Thomas Crown Affair, really cool scene, really cool movie. <laughs> anyway, so she uh, glider breaks, slams into the side of the mountain, and she's horrifically injured. Would that be catastrophic enough to come to you? And then if so, how is she going to pay for all of this? Because experts are expensive, attorneys are expensive, staff are expensive. You know, what's she going to do? Because she's not a trust fund baby. Yeah. You know, and, and that's kind of the interesting thing, because in our society, everyone at all economic levels gets injured. They're, you know, from the poorest of the poor to the richest of the rich. People get hurt in our universe. Um, and as a society, we have deemed that the way to uh, essentially um, incentivize lawyers to help folks in this situation is to work on what's called a contingency fee. So instead of someone paying me an hourly rate, I get a percentage of the recovery at the end of the case. So what does that mean? That means that I got to put my money where my mouth is. So if I believe in a case, you know, I, my law partner and I, I mean, we have put over a million dollars uh, into an individual case to that, you know, that was hotly contested and, and fought vigorously through experts, deposition, travel costs, uh, prep for trial, all the, the, you know, the tech, all that stuff that you need for a very sophisticated case that has been uh, vigorously defended um, because we, we believe one, we are uniquely suited to do that, but two, it, it's, it's a way to fight a cause that our clients couldn't afford that. They couldn't do that. Now, with that being said, you know, unfortunately, that means that a lot of the times we have to have uh, it's, it's kind of like a stool like uh, that has three legs. And if any one of those three legs is gone, the stool will fall over. One, you have to have someone who's at fault. Did someone cause this accident? Two, you have to have uh, damages. Someone has to be injured. There has to be. Uh, you know, true, true injuries. But lastly, there has to be an ability to pay. If any one of those is not there, you do not have a, a, a personal injury case. And, you know, and, and a lot of my job is advising people that there is not a means of recovery for them. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I would say, you know, in that universe, there's a lot of folks that I have to say, devastating, awful things happen. And, you know, there isn't a mechanism for you to recover. I mean, probably the most uh, horrific situation that I witnessed in that universe was years ago. Um, it was, I get this case where a 37-year-old uh, guy who has built a small, successful real estate practice, has a stay-at-home wife and three kids. They, they close a big deal and they go out for a night of shenanigans. They uh, are responsible, have a designated driver. Uh, they get a flat tire, pull over on the side of the road. A individual who had worked a long shift, uh, was driving home, dozed off, slammed into the back of the vehicle, caused two people to die and, and paralyzed two other people in that vehicle. They only had a minimum insurance policy. Oh. It wasn't enough money to get the people even in the ground. And now you have a woman that no longer has the a stay-at-home wife 
who no longer has a husband to provide. And there are horrible situations in our society where that happens every single day. So, you know, I, I have to help people walk through that journey 10 times before I find the people that we can take them in a journey that we actually can try to receive some sort of like balancing of, of the equities for them. Yeah. Well, and, and I want to break down a little bit of the contingency fee idea too, because uh, this is actually one of our kind of counterpoints that a lot of people talk about that we're, we're going to get into. But, you know, when you say you, you put in a million dollars, just to clarify with everybody, that's not your attorney time. That's actually cash out of the firm's pocket to pay for the $100,000 yes. expert, to pay for mm -hmm. the, you know, 20 plane trips back and forth, the deposition court reporters, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the reenactment studies, all those mm -hmm. types of things, right? Absolutely. And so, yeah, no, that, that doesn't count the tens of thousands of man hours right. that might go into uh, prosecuting, you know, one of these cases. Yeah. And, and that's the other part, going back to the three stool d deal, is that if you don't recover anything on an, under a contingency fee agreement, the law, the law firm loses that money. You're not you're not recovering it. Yeah, the client that, is not that, responsible. Right. So and that's why that three-legged approach is case, important. Oh, oh, sorry. And that's okay. I was just saying that's why your analysis of that three-legged approach is, is vital to be able to figure out, can we actually get a recovery for our clients? Absolutely. And I do feel, though, that this three-legged approach, right, because it is so critical to have someone that has the ability to pay, right? And so generally, that's going to be a corporation with deep pockets, correct? Uh, corporation or, or company. Or yeah. So a lot of my clients are insurance companies. So, you know, I basically defend Satan's minions. And so <laughs> <laughs> hey, at, least, at least you can be honest about it. Andrea. I can be. I can <laughs> be. And so, you know, but they have a purpose, right? right? Because, you know, Satan's minions also allow a lot of small businesses, small mom and pop shops, maybe overhaul repair companies that deal with repairing engines or repairing various avionics parts. <laughs> and they allow them to operate, right? But, you know, at the end of the day, you have someone who maybe has been hurt in an airplane accident. And so there is this tension, right? You've got the insurance companies who so Satan's minions facilitate the small mom and pop business model that we all love here in Texas. But then we have, you know, a dead child, which no one loves because that's an atrocity. But then you have this perception of people, perhaps this insurance company in the mom and pop shop, they didn't do anything wrong, but they're being sued because they're the only party that actually has a good insurance company with deep pockets. Yeah. And they're the only party that can actually have an insurance company pay for all of the costs incurred you know, for the dead child and say the mom that was paralyzed because she was flying with the child. And so now we've got you know, people going after an insurance company you know, we're going after a small mom and pop shop only because of the pockets that they have, even though they didn't really do anything wrong. And the person who really did something wrong, right, they just don't have a lot of money. I mean, do we see this this come up and oh, yeah. kind of get this storyline a lot? Oh, yeah. You know, and, 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 and you, you actually raise a lot of very valid points. Here's the deal. Like, no system is perfect. Mm -hmm. And and I I'm not one of these absolutists. Like I think that insurance is critical for a functioning market society. Mm -hmm. they, they, it, and and so, but once again, it is a very shrewd by the numbers business. Um, one of the important things that 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 insurance policies provide that a lot of people don't understand is it's not just that they're going to pay, it's that they have a duty to defend. And so they hire zealous advocates like you that allow an adversarial system for us to dispute and, and conflict these things without the mom and pop shop having to pay for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's that's what your job is. And, and I think uh, people don't, give our system enough credit. Like the vast bulk of the unmeritorious claims mm -hmm. get knocked out. And that's interesting. Uh, I'm glad you bring that up because there definitely is this perception that we live in an extraordinarily litigious society where great aunt Harriet says, oh no, I stubbed my toe in a pothole on this corporation's private sidewalk. Oh no, I'm in so much pain. I want to sue the corporation and get millions. Right. I mean, is Grant Aunt Harriet's claim at that point? I mean, it doesn't sound that meritorious to me, but I mean, I'm usually on the defense side. <laughs> yeah. No. And, and, and as I say, 
any time where there are potential market benefits, you're definitely going to have good and bad actors. Most of the time, it's some some you know measure in between. Um, but the the reality is is you know what other way can we do it, mm-hmm. right? Like, I mean, sure. I mean, if you really want my like real philosophical take yeah. what we it. probably need to do is actually just have like accessible health care for people and a way for um them to deal if they've been catastrophically injured better through our disability system that way it's not something that the marketplace has to shoulder the burden for yeah uh, I'm glad you, oh i'm sorry go ahead yeah but go ahead No, I'm just going to say I'm glad you brought that up because let's talk about tort reform, right? Because things were a lot different back in what what was pre-tort reform, the 70s? Well, there's there's been varying levels of tort reform over the last 50 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, probably because we don't have time to discuss all the ins and outs of tort reform, but if you had to sum up in a a brief explanation to our listeners, what, what is tort reform? What did it accomplish? And then... Some of your, I mean, we talked about this off air, but some of our negative ramifications that came with it. So uh, just, just a, a, essentially a tort is a civil wrong. So just, just so people understand that. And the tort laws are the laws that involve people's way that they can try to get compensation for being injured. And so there's a variety of different areas of laws like that. And, you know, the notable uh, tort reform here in Texas that was a really big political issue back in the early 2000s was medical malpractice tort reform. And so there were sweeping changes back in the early 2000s uh, in order to uh, hopefully stymie some of the less meritorious places. Because... It is true. You don't you don't want your doctors to be wrapped up in, you know, ridiculous litigation because, you know, anybody that that, you know, unfortunately, if you're seeing doctors, probably you're you're probably in have health problems and issues. Right. So, like, you know, there's there's lots of concerns. You don't want doctors to be worrying about that. So uh, and it was just a winning political issue at the time because of all of the. the PR that had been done to uh, sink the McDonald's case. So people didn't understand, you know, what was going on there. So, you know, there was kind of some cynical moves to 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 limit the plaintiff's ability to uh, make a case. So what does that mean? It changes the fundamental interaction. So instead of letting a jury award what they believe is appropriate in the situation, they put caps on damage areas. So uh, if you're a quadriplegic and because of someone screwing up, um, you will only be able to recover $250,000 of pain and suffering. It doesn't matter if for the next 40 years, every day, every waking moment of your life is an excruciating pain. And that 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 is the, the, the vision and the lens that you perceive your existence through is agonizing pain. You're not going to recover more than $250,000 of damages in that area. So what does that do? It, it, it limits the uh, damages. That also means that it limits the, the lawyers that are willing to pursue claims in that area. And so... That's something that our society does when it's trying to balance, you know, the cost benefit of of these different negligence systems. And so, you know, once again, I'm not an absolutist. I I do think that there, in any system, there can be excesses and they do need to be regularly reviewed and checked by the people to make sure that our society is functioning, you know, well. Uh, But I will say like a lot of things in our society, things are done not necessarily with the grandest of intentions, but with kind of cynical actors in a political and market sphere that are mm-hmm. you know, trying to achieve certain objectives that maybe don't have a lot to do with the actual area uh, yeah. that they're trying to, to deal with. Yeah, no, I agree wholeheartedly. And, and I could talk for hours and hours about the issues mm-hmm. and problems that I see with tort reform. It's kind of mm-hmm. like that. I, put my, my personal viewpoints in there. But mm-hmm. um, I, I do think that, in my opinion, this has been a, it was a pendulum swing, went mm-hmm. way far, way too far to the right. 
and has a has had a lot of negative ramifications on individuals who don't have the resources to fight or lobby or do the things to try and reform that. So mm -hmm. I, I appreciate you talking about that on our show and yeah. really kind of walking our listeners through that. Uh, I know one of the big things that we yes. want to talk about current events wise. I'll, I'll let you tee this up, Andrea. Sure thing. So in the world of coronavirus, we now have a vaccine that's out that people are rolling out. They're getting their shots. But I have a two-part question. The first one is going to be coronavirus specific. There were reports recently, and I think it was Moderna, who said that they reported within the past week a unusually high number of severe allergic reactions to the shot. Now, if I recall correctly, it was only about 10 people out in California, but still, you know, that's something. If one of those 10 people turned around and said, I had such a bad reaction, I want to sue Moderna for causing me harm, do they have a legitimate cause of action? So, um, short answer, yes, in a, and this is not the area of law that I practice in specifically, mm -hmm. so I will do kind of 30,000 foot like concepts. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say, you know, you go and get an injection of something and, and, and you have a specific response that uh, injures you. Well, so then you have to look at, uh, that's part of the reason why we didn't have a vaccine back in February. I mean, they, they did the, the, the gene sequencing of this virus like incredibly early like back at the very beginning of the year. And they actually had the, 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 the basic uh, chemical structure of this uh, vaccine put together back in like February. Mm -hmm. But they went through, uh, you know, these, these testing and trials in a very expedited manner in order to try to get this thing to market. Um, and uh, likely uh, because of that and because of our society's need to get this out quickly, um, they, they had a faster testing protocol than what normally would happen. So uh, like they're on these uh, kind of pharmaceutical claims. What you look at is during these processes of putting together a, an, an item that's gonna be put into people's bodies, did they see this coming? And did they fail to warn that there was going to be an issue with it? Mm -hmm. um, now, I do believe because of the expedited nature and great need of our society for this, that you know, there, there has been some laxing of some of the requirements there that you might see in, you know, uh, a pill that's designed for cholesterol control mm -hmm. or, you know, other things like that. Um, and so I do think that there would be potential claims there, you know, if there are adverse side effects that are not disclosed that were known. Oh, interesting. Very interesting. And see, I think there's going to be a lot of this sort of litigation in the future. I, At least I think there is. I mean, I am not yeah. a PI attorney. So, you, Paul, I think you probably have a better idea than, than me. But I want to swing this issue around to kind of the other end of the spectrum. So we've all heard of anti-vaxxers. And is an interesting discussion about anti-vaxxing. And I think that the coronavirus vaccine has brought up these issues uh, that anti-vaxxers discuss back yeah. to the public spotlight. And I know people who, personally, who said that they think some of these traditional childhood vaccines, like for measles, mumps, what have you, they believe those things gave their child autism. Now, if a parent believes that their child became autistic as a result of one of these traditional childhood vaccines, something that's been very well tested, and they want to make a claim and they want to sue the doctor who administered it, the nurse who administered, they want to sue the physician's group that the doctor is part of, they want to sue the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical company. company, right? The one with the biggest pockets, yeah. how could I forget? That's where my brain went. <laughs> exactly. That's where everyone's brain should probably be going. You know. What would you say to that mother who is, you know, obviously in great pain, her child is suffering? What, what, do, you, what do you say to her? Okay, um, I say this. This is one of the systems, in, in, and it's kind of fun because it kind of wraps up a lot of the stuff that we talked about. Mm -hmm. I can give you a response that both looks at tort reform 
And that also looks at the contingency fee issue mm -hmm. as a way to uh, that, that, that probably makes this prohibitive for individuals. So first, you have to find a lawyer that is willing to take this on on a contingency basis. And that means that they are willing to expend their own resources to deal with this. Now, here's the problem. Tort reform in Texas has required that whenever there is a claim against a medical entity, that you have to, as a threshold matter, uh, file essentially contemporaneously, well, dates are a little bit different, uh, with your petition, what is called a Chapter 74 report. That means you have to hire an expert that with a reasonable degree of medical probability says that the actions that were taken uh, were negligent and had a direct causal relation to the injuries that, that this child has suffered as a result of this vaccination. Here's the problem for anti-vaxxers. There is virtually no actually well-regarded studies, data, or information that supports their claims. Now, there's a few yahoos out there but it's not someone that, uh, that, that you could hire to be an expert under penalty of perjury in our system to make these claims. And so essentially, people aren't going to do it. I'm not going to I'm not going to waste, you know, fifty thousand dollars to not be able to actually pursue a claim because it has no factual relevance in our world. Like, and that's, that's one of the good things about the legal system is that you have to actually provide proof and, and, and meritorious arguments for your claims. I mean, that's, and, and, and just because you say something and repeat it a thousand times doesn't mean it's true. And we have a plague of that in our society right now yeah. of, of agenda oriented, non-factual based like arguments. And it, it the law field is one of the last bastions of resistance for that because we have to prove what we're talking about. And we have to have, we have judges in, who, who act as umpires to you know, help us sift through what is information and data that you know, is, has sufficient quality to be presented to a jury to determine these, these important issues. And so I don't think that you ever, as a threshold issue, would ever make it in front of a jury because there's just not a way to meritoriously make these like claims for vaccinations. So mm -hmm. I would advise them to probably spend their times and efforts uh, in, in learning to uh, work with their child uh, that has autism, which probably has had large, like, uh, statistical amounts in our population throughout all time. It's just that we're finally able to actually recognize it mm. and diagnose it now. So yes, there's more like more occurrences of it, but it does not appear to be causally related to you know any kind of human contrivance that we've found right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul, I think that did tie it up, like you kind of said, so. and, and uh, really, really enjoyed having you on today. I think that the insight and the experience you've had and the passion with which you talk about it. I mean, really, it tells a lot about your profession, 100%. a lot about you, and I think it really helps our listeners out whenever they're trying to sort through what does this, what does all this really entail in mm -hmm. personal injury law? Well, I appreciate the opportunity to hang out with such uh, dashingly attractive hosts, <laughs> and it's been a real joy. Hey, awesome. well, we, we can have you on to say that as, as much as you, know, you want yeah, to. Feel so free. We'll, we'll take those coffee. Every day, <laughs> I speak truths. I've got the evidence to submit to the court. <laughs> well, Paul, thank you so yeah, much again for coming much, on. Thank you guys again for listening. Uh, I'm sure you learned a lot from listening to Paul and, and know a lot more about personal injury law now. Uh, stay tuned for closing arguments. We've got a, a Georgia lawyer who took part in the Capitol siege and he was denied bail on the 21st of January. It's going to be interesting to see where that goes. Hey y'all, thank you so much for listening to Hashtag Lawyer Today. But wait, before you go, we want to make sure that you know where to find us on all the socials. 
So catch up with us on the audiovisual portion on YouTube. We have a hashtag lawyer channel there that we're very excited for you to take a look at if you want to put some faces to names. I know I love doing that. Make sure to follow us on our Instagrams, whether it be the hashtag lawyered Instagram or Austin's and my personal Instagrams. We check all three, so make sure to DM us or frankly leave comments on all of our latest posts to make sure that we're covering the topics that you guys are interested in. And if you have any questions or you're like, hey, I heard this in the news today. I think it's really interesting. I kind of want you and Austin to break it down for me and give the legal perspective so that I am well-equipped at my next dinner party or Zoom cocktail hour, you know, COVID and all that, to be able to discuss this with my friends. So again, thank you so much for listening. Make sure to rate and review the podcast on whatever platform that you're listening to. And we are so thankful that you're listening and tune back in next week. Bye, y'all. A Georgia lawyer who took part in the Capitol siege was denied bail on January 21st because the judge said he posed too much of a risk to the community. William Calhoun, lawyer in Georgia, claims he was one of the first stormtroopers to kick in Nancy Pelosi's door and also states that Pelosi would have been torn to little pieces had the mob found her. At his bail hearing on charges for charges ranging from entering a restricted building, disorderly conduct, and tampering with a witness, Calhoun's copious social media posts touting violent retribution against the media and Democrats and ethnic cleansing against the Democrats, as well as encouraging stopping the left with force of arms, were all introduced into evidence and considered by the court. The judge denied him bail and the judge is quoted actually saying that he's been corrupted by, the, uh, corrupted by or seduced by dangerous and violent ideology that considers the U.S. in a state of civil war. And ultimately, the judge concluded, because of the corrupting and dangerous ideology that has poisoned this man's mind, I would not trust him to do anything I told him to do. This is definitely going to spark white right-wing supporters of Trump and his ideology to claim that they're violating Mr. Calhoun's First Amendment rights, as well as equal protection and due process concerns because of the way his bail was denied versus other inmates. It'll be interesting to see what actually happens, but is the judge really wrong in concluding this? Keep watching and figure out how this story turns out and how this plays out in light of the rest of the Capitol siege story.